in contrast to uh, natural rubber, we have this phosphorus group here. And we can do uh, reactions there. We can bind it to metals. Here's a reaction with gold. And you can see the NMR shifts when you react with gold. So this is the uncomplex. This is a complex. And you can measure the GPC. This gives you the molecular weight. The molecular weight here is 23,000 compared to the starting material, which is 8,000. And gold is very, very heavy atoms. So that explains that huge increase in the mass. So we've made functional polymers. Phosphorus clearly makes the polymer functional. We can bind it to metals. But can it make it smart? And I have no idea what the time is because we started late. So I'm relying on you. I'm going to try to get through this. So let's go back to our initial idea of what it, what it means to be smart. I, I said we all know intuitively about humanity and smartness. But what about a material and smartness? If you go, go back to uh, the dictionary, this time I'm using the Oxford Dictionary, so we moved up from Google, um, and you look for smart, talks about well-dressed. Well, I'm not the most smartly dressed person. There's a lot of people here who are very smartly dressed, but certainly not me. But that's not really applicable to what we're looking for here. What is, is, is this idea of smart devices. This, this is definition out of the Oxford Dictionary says smart devices have to be programmed so that as to be capable of some independent action. And it uses an example of smart weapons. I don't know why it does. It. But anyway, you have to be able to program to take an independent action. That will make it smart. It has to be able to make a decision. And not only does it have to be able to make a decision, it has to be able to report that decision in some way. So we have these phosphorus polymers that I've been talking about, and they have functional groups. Maybe we can use these functional groups to be programmed the material to take a decision. Then we need to be able to have the material tell us the decision. If we can do that, we have something that's smart. So can we introduce something that's light responsive so that we can see what is going on at these phosphorus atoms? And that will be able to tell us what its decision is. Let's see how this works. So we made these phosphoalkenes with naphthal and uh, phenanthyl groups. So these are our chromophores now. They're UV active chromophores. And uh, you can polymerize them. We can make polymers. We've seen all this kind of stuff. We can characterize them. They have this crazy isomerized structure. And we can show that unequivocally. Here's some NMR, the polymer's broad, always polymer signals will be broad, the monomers are sharp. And we can measure the spectra now of these polymers, and these are the absorption spectra. They don't look a lot different. Uh, we functionalize the polymer with different electrophiles through binding to the phosphorus atoms, so borane, gold, sulfur, oxygen. And you can see that, that all the functionalized ones, they are flat out here, the other ones have a little bump. That's the transition from the lone pair uh, of phosphorus. Now the chromophore, of course, is responsible for these groups, these uh, bands. Now you measure the emission, we're starting to th see something that's looking smart. Because here, none of the materials are emissive but one. The only one that's emissive is the oxide. So this material is, is, is smart for knowing when it's bound to oxygen. And it's telling us when it's bound to oxygen by turning on the emission. Now this emission is at 340 nanometers and that's not visible. So we need to use a machine to see it. Let's make it visible. So now we'll put in a pyrene group. We did this in collaboration with Graham Bodwell who's an expert in that type of chemistry. We can make that polymer again. We can characterize it, we can oxidize it, and the unoxidized material is not emissive. You can now see the emission because pyrene emits in the visible region. And this, you see very little emission. This you see reasonably good emission. You can tell with the naked eye these are different. You can even see the surface here has been oxidized a little bit because it's a little bit more blue at the top than at the bottom. That's just because there's there's air above the sample, and it's slowly oxidizing. 
So we, we have a smart polymer. So polymethylene <laughs> phosgene is smart. It can tell us when it reacts with a certain type of reactant. Or it, it can detect something. It can say, I've reacted with oxygen. You can see the blue. But we want to make something that's even smarter. So to do that, we want to actually uh, put the chromophores in the backbone of the polymer and the phosphorus in the backbone. And if we can put both of them in the backbone, it should make it much more sensitive. Now, to do that, we, uh, we need to make something that we call a pi-conjugated polymer. Now, these are known for phosphorus. There's several examples. This one is the most famous, polyphospholes. These have formed LED-based materials. And these, mix, these polymers are all inspired by classical organic systems, but the phosphorus brings the functionality. It's what's going to make it smart. So we wondered, could we make an analog of polyphenylene ethylene? This system is actually used in, in sensor applications already, especially for things like uh, nitro, benzenes, and explosive materials. So we tried to make this. There's a couple different ways you can think about making it. You could use a lithiation strategy. For many reasons, this, this is not desirable. Um, we came across this catalytic reaction from a Russian group and uh, this is a really great reaction. It uses a nickel catalyst to couple a PCL2 with an alkyne. And uh, this is what we're going to choose to make our polymers. And we have to make a bifunctional monomer. Two bifunctional monomers, we should be able to make a polymer. And so we did that. Here's the alkyne, the diene, the PCL2. We can make a red solid. The immediate color change to red tells us there's something going on here and that it's conjugated in some way. Um, we, we see here some moldy evidence for this kind of a structure. This is not soluble, though. We want a soluble polymer that's going to be smart. So we solubilize it by adding hexyl groups. You can do that very readily. Here's the uh, uh, now soluble red polymer. And uh, uh, we can uh, follow the polymerization. It's a very clean reaction. And, and this is uh, phosphorus bringing the light, as we're going to see. This polymer is smart. So if you look at the unoxidized form, it does not emit at all. And you see the oxidized form emits blue. So you can now see if it's bound to oxygen. Here's the spectra, but don't worry about those. They're just telling you the same thing you can see with your eye. Now we can make a lot of different polymers. So this is now a really easy reaction. You're using a nickel catalyst. You make any alkyne, any PCL compound, you can make a polymer out of it. <laughs> you can oxidize those, and they all turn on fluorescent. <coughs> so we engineered this polymer. The reason why we were interested in this one is that this fluorinyl group is known to increase emission. And so if you in incorporate this, you get a higher emission. Higher emission just means you're going you're gonna to see it much more easily going to be much brighter. And so it turns out that's the case. And what we did was we went through and, and looked at every metal we could find. And this is where it gets really smart again. Um, if you notice, many of these metals, including things which, which do bind phosphorus, such as palladium, gold, gold, uh, uh, silver, and platinum, they don't turn on the fluorescence. The only thing that turns on the fluorescence here in a great way is gold. So now we have something that is selectively fluorescent when it sees gold. That could be useful. And you can see it. So this is 10 to the minus 5 molar in uh, THF. We add one equivalent of analyte, so very low concentrations you can see the emission. And I can show you this uh, in a movie. This is the initial. Now we're going to come in. You'll see here, uh, uh, it's a little bit dark, but yeah, there we just added it. You can already see it's turning on. That's one equivalent of gold per phosphorus at 10 to the minus 5 molar. So very, very low concentrations. And it's telling us gold is present in the solution. And it's selective. So if you do this with rhodium, we can actually make the rhodium complex. And 
it doesn't emit. You can, you can add rhodium in, it never turns on the emit. You see a little blip at the beginning. But if you add gold, it turns on the fluorescence. So the blue curve is with gold. The other curve is with rhodium. We can isolate this as a model system. We've done a lot of model work. The interest of time, I won't go into it today. But something is very special about the binding properties of gold with this uh, polymer, which means that we can select uh, for gold and sense gold in solution. Not only with the polymers, but with simple molecules like this. So in summary, and again, I, as I started late, I don't know when I was supposed to stop. I hope I'm a little bit on time. Um, phosphorus makes polymers smart. And uh, I need to thank a lot of highly talented individuals. Um, this is my first PhD student from India. Uh, just joined this year. She hasn't participated in this work yet, but she's working on this gold sensing stuff. So quite excited about that. I have a number of collaborators. Mentioned everybody who did the work on the slides as they went along. So I won't go through that again. We're funded by our national funding agency, in addition to some companies and stuff over the years. Uh, I finally should tell you a little bit about Canada. It's a big country like India, but very sparsely populated by comparison. Um, and I thank you again for bringing me to India. You guys say it's cold, but you, you ain't got nothing on us here in Canada. This is what it's like back home. Um, you know, this is typical morning. You wake up, you have to dig the car out from the snow. And then you have to go to work, so you go drive down the road on the way. But seriously, in much of Canada, that's pretty much the case right now. It's very true, but I live way over here. I'm from right here, but I live over here. Um, the, top, the north part is frozen all, pretty much all year long. Uh, most of the rest of the country is frozen for about five months out of the year. But where I live is this little oasis that we don't actually get uh, much cold weather. In fact, we're supposed to get a flurries, snow flurries, um, on the weekend. I'll be here, of course, so that's okay. I was reading the news this morning. And uh, this is a picture taken in January of our campus at UBC. This is the chemistry building. This is looking north, so if you go north and fly over the North Pole, you'll get to Delhi. That's exactly what I did. 15 hours to get here by plane. And this is a picture from the mountains looking south towards the United States and over the city center of Vancouver. It's quite a spectacular place. I encourage you to come and visit. I hope I can be uh, uh, even partially as hospitable as, as you have been to me. And I look forward to meeting a lot of you in the next two days and chatting about science. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Derek, for this uh, really great and inspiring talk. Uh, you have convinced us that uh, Canada, Vancouver is really a hotspot in Canada. And, well, you also presented some interesting science, and you were so much on time that we even have time for three or four questions. If there are any. Yes, please. I have a question related to the fluorescence. So, yes. what's the reason that it fluoresces when you have gold attached to it? And why it does not fluoresce when you have lithium or other? Right. I could have taken 15 to 20 more minutes to tell Go you ahead. a little bit. <laughs> no, I don't want to. Uh, um, it's. it's, it's we're hypothesizing right now. So when when I sh I have we've done a lot of NMR experiments where we titrate in gold and rhodium, mainly gold and rhodium because we know they both bind, they both give complex products. They're analogous products. The rhodium binds to phosphorus, as does the uh, the rhodium binds to phosphorus, as does gold. And we just don't have a crystal structure of the rhodium complex yet. That's like the missing link at the moment. But what, what happens, gold it forms a fluxional material. And I think what's, what might be happening is gold is moving between the phosphorus and the alkyne. You can make alkyne complexes of gold and phosphine complexes of gold. We isolate the phosphine complex, but maybe in solution there's some fluxionality and maybe that interaction is somehow turning on the fluorescence. It should be that whenever you bind the lone pair of phosphorus, you should turn it on. 
So every metal system should turn it on. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of magic at the moment. But I think it has something to do with this binding property. Uh, and I think we have years of study ahead of us to figure it out exactly. But thank you for your question. Yes, please. Uh, like uh, in the polymerization of olefins, is it possible to control stereochemistry in polymerization of these compounds? Uh, of course, I've been answering that question for close to 20 years now. Um, and it's a really good one, and I'd love to be able to control it. We, we thought we could with things like, normally in an anionic polymerization, when you want to control the stereochemistry, you add spartine, which is an, an antiomerically pure natural product which binds to the lithium and that forms a tight ion pair at the end and that allows you to control the chirality at carbon but it only works if you have a, a bulky acrylate or some really bulky system that, that the interaction actually forces um, an antioselectivity. To do that you make chiral helical polymers. Um, there, we thought we could do it. We hoped we could do it. It doesn't work with spartine. Um, and the reason is because of the isomerization. The actual propagating species is the CH2 group of the benzylic mesetyl. And because of that, that group is not bulky enough that spartine will influence any chirality. So we have not been able to control the chirality. Now, the other situation is the phosphorus center is, is a source of tacticity. Now, tacticity is important in polypropylene because you can make isotactic. Now, that's not a chiral polymer, but it, it, it's racemic still, but it's it, the, the adjacent groups as you go down the chain have either the same chirality, the opposite chirality, or a completely random chirality. So in many types of polypropylene, and of course, the isotactic one is the one we use mostly, in, 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 and it's made with, with metal-based initiators that are have certain symmetries associated with them. Many students may have learned that in their organometallics classes. But nonetheless, uh, we haven't been able to do that with these polymers yet. But the tacticity control is something that I think is feasible with these polymers. The full chirality control is going to be really, really hard. But I still have a few years left in my career, so I hope we're going to finally do it sometime. Thank you. Okay. Professor Nita? Um, excellent talk. Enjoyed it very much. Um, I have a question in entirely different uh, domain. Uh, because you have a functional handle, uh, how easy or how challenging it is to depolymerize them? And I ask this question from the point of view of sustainability. And therefore, added to this is also uh, what about the biodegradability of these polymers? That's a great question. Um, so early on, when, when I first presented this work, I presented the thermogravimetric analysis. And it, it, it decays uh, almost perfectly. So, so it just, when you, when you heat it up, you get very little ceramic yield. So essentially, it depolymerizes. Um, and we haven't ever detected the, 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 the phosphoalkene again or anything like that. Um, I've been trying to convince my students to bury the polymer in the soil and, you know, just put it in the window. Maybe they have a plant or something. Hopefully it wouldn't be toxic, but let's face it, phosphorus is a huge part of our bodies, so maybe it will be okay, but of course nerve agents are incredibly toxic and those are phosphorus compounds too. So phosphorus can be good and bad. I think there's a, an opportunity there, and I, I, I think that, that I'll write a proposal on it maybe, but we haven't investigated it at all. We can make copolymers, so you might be able to make biodegradable polystyrene by incorporating these systems. I think, I think it could be cool, yeah, but we haven't done it. Okay. Good question. Um, I think our time is used up now, so um, I thank the speaker and all uh, people participating in the discussion and I think we're having a break now with high tea and there will be plenty of time for further questions you can ask Professor Gates. So thank you all for coming and for listening and for being an active part of this presentation. No.
Thank you, sir. With this, we come to the end of the plenary session. I invite all of you to proceed for tea, which is being served in the back lawns. I request all the student volunteers to please guide. Also, I request the audience to please remain seated till the dignitaries have left the hall. We shall resume with the proceedings, the first technical session, at 12.15 p.m. sharp. to take his seat on the dais. Affiliated with the University of Düsseldorf, Germany, Dr. Hegley has had a long academic career. His research interests lie in the field of NMR spectroscopy, which was also the basis of his doctoral thesis. He has been the Erasmus professor, Université de Nantes, France, for many years and has been invited as a visiting professor to the University of Innsbruck, Austria and the University of British Columbia, Canada. We welcome you, sir. <coughs> I would also like to welcome the invited speakers for this session, Professor Casey Kumaraswamy, Professor Dietrich Goodart and Professor R.K. Bansal. May I now request Professor Casey Kumaraswamy to take his seat on the dais. I now request Professor Hegley to take over the session's proceedings. Okay, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here in this wonderful city and I wish to thank Professor Pansal for inviting me. And I have the pleasure to announce a speaker who is known to you all. It is Dr. Kumar Swami, a professor in the School of Chemistry of Hyderabad. And he does not wish to be introduced in a longer way than I do it now. Yeah. So please, start your lecture. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Hegel. Uh, let me begin my talk by first thanking uh, Professor Bansa for inviting me for this uh, wonderful uh, meeting. Okay. The topic that I have chosen is uh, novel transformations involving alleles, all kinds, yeah. no. uh, all kinds, nitriles, vinamides, or in a nose. Okay. The number of uh, substrates that you have is too many, but I hope that uh, you will be able to at least appreciate parts of it uh, when the talk goes on. Uh, let me begin my talk by acknowledging the uh, funding source, sources, Department of Science and Technology as well as uh, Council of uh, Scientific and Industrial Research, New Delhi. In addition to that one, we also have got a lot of funding from the University of Hyderabad. The names of co-workers who were involved in this particular uh, presentation are uh, uh, given here. Okay, I don't uh, want to elaborate too much on that one, but then they are my workers. Thank you. Sir. Now, the objectives of uh, my work in total are twofold. One is 
the exploration of new reactions and structures with an eye on intermediates that are involved in the reactions and then possibly their utility thereafter. Okay, the topics that I want to cover today, if the time permits, are these alkyl phosphonates and related alenes, alkyl in a known reactivity, and then uh, followed by ruthenium uh, uh, and gold catalyzed reactions, then vinamide reactivity, and then isothiocyanate and diazo reactivity, I think that I will skip, and then uh, the last one, palladium catalyzed reactions of indole substrate, if time permits. Now, why did they choose a topic like this? The reason why I chose a topic like this is because the systems that I have mentioned there in the topic, all of them contain a sp hybridized carbon. So the reactivity of that one is what is uh, important for me. So different students come and they choose systems uh, of their choice and all that. They do some work, go away and all that. But overall, the theme is that they should have the sub one of the substrates as the one uh, as a which has a carbon with sp hybridization okay so these are the substrates even carbon dioxide is mentioned over there okay sorry carbon dioxide and then isothiocyanates isocyanates vinamides alkene system alkene system and then another type of alkene system and all that okay now, uh, we'll start with the alanyl phosphonates or alanyl phosphine oxides. The reason why I start like this is because all my work, uh, subsequent work, were based on some reactions which we had to do in order to get our precursors, phosphorus three precursors like this. Okay, we did a lot of work on phosphorus chemistry long before. Okay, the, some of this, uh, there are the, this, this review here, accounts of chemical research on pentacoordinate phosphorus and then chemical reviews, this is on Mitsunobu reaction wherein uh, phosphorus, phosphines are being used and then this is on hydrogen bonding and all that. In that context, what we needed was this kind of a phosphorus 3 precursor. So, one of the students tried to use this uh, propargyl alcohol. In that uh, connection, what he got was not this one. But this kind of an alene, phosphorylated alene or phosphorus based alene. Okay, this is a known reaction that he didn't know for us before. But then he got this one, then I thought that uh, why not utilize this one further for my future work and all that. That's how we started as far as this uh, alene chemistry and alkene chemistry and things like that are concerned. Now, alene system, you know that it's a uh, very reactive system. Long back people are thinking that they are only, uh, what can I say, very reactive systems and not uh, uh, so stable and all that. They have many interesting uh, features. Axial chirality, three reactive carbon centers and substituent, substituent loading capacity and all that. Now, lot, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, the first part of my talk will, concent will concentrate on the phosphorus base alleles wherein there is one phosphorus to carbon bond or three phosphorus to carbon bonds, but then there is an alene molecule over there. One of the substances is phosphorus base. That is the kind of system that we, uh, uh, that we have here. The reason why these things are very useful is because when you have one phosphorus, you can always, uh, if, uh, if you are doing the reactions, each compound will have only one phosphorus atom and therefore by, for monitoring the reactions, it is much easier if you have this phosphorus base system. And then afterwards, you know, you can extend this to the alkene chemistry, normal alkene chemistry wherein phosphorus is not involved in all Now, one of the reactions that I want to show you is this one. Before this one, I will show you this particular thing which I showed you before. See, this phosphorus 3 compound with a chlorine substituent, okay, treat with propargyl alcohol, the final compound that you get is an alkene. Okay, these are very, very easily prepared. It is not difficult at all, okay? And uh, that is the type of thing that we were trying to do here. This forward and backward, I have a little bit of problem there. Okay, yeah. This is the chlorophosphine. We treated that with the propargyl alcohol, which contains a nitro group over there. Now, the normal thing that we expected here was a nulline, wherein this particular substrate was hydrogen. Okay, that part also will come to you later on. 
But then in this particular reaction, what happened was that the hydrogen which was there was replaced by a second mole of this uh, phosphorus substrate. Okay, and then there was an oxidation while the, while doing the column. But the important point is not that one as far as this particular uh, uh, side is concerned. The important point was that the compound crystallized in a chiral space group. When it crystallized in a chiral space group, P21 by 2121, my student was rather curious. I told him, okay, if it has crystallized in this one, go and check up uh, after uh, uh, going to the circular diaprism spectrum in this one. And then what he did was to go to this instrument, circular diaprism instrument, and then pick up different crystals and then uh, find out how they behave on that particular thing. That is what is shown in the next slide. You see, you see that he could get two different types of crystals, the enantiomers, okay. He could easily see that one, one going up and one coming down and therefore he was able to separate the two enantiomers by hand picking, something like the Louis, Louis Pasteur's method. Okay, that is something which is interesting and as far as I know in allyl chemistry this is the first example wherein you have got uh, this uh, uh, spont, uh, this one, okay, this is the problem, the spontaneous resolution of chiral allyls for the first time, okay, spontaneous resolution in nature also is quite important, organic chemist may be angry with me but then to say this one but then Professor <laughs> Mehta is smiling. But then the thing is that how in the nature the first chiral organic system got developed, okay? As, an, you know, as a person who was uh, trained as an inorganic chemist, I would say that uh, first even organic chiral molecule might have been synthesized via silica. Quartz, you know, is optically active on the surface of that one. Chemical reaction could have occurred in the presence of sunlight and all that. Maybe that has happened or something like that. But then the interesting thing is that initially there was no chiral. I am not using any chiral uh, auxiliary or any such thing. We are able to uh, separate the two enantiomers directly here. That is the point over here. And that is an that is a topic of interest for many people. Okay. Now, that sector dichroism also showed that one. And then not just that one. If you use one is to one stratometry of the propargyl alcohol and the phosphorus substrate, what you get is a uh, seven-membered ring system. Now, if you look at the seven-membered ring system closely over here, you see that there is an elimination of carbon dioxide over there. One carbon less than what you have in the uh, combining both the starting materials. That's a really very interesting reaction as far as we are concerned. Okay? We believe that the whole reaction takes place via the allene intermediate. The NATO group is supposed to do many tricks and all that. The reaction mechanism is, uh, as far as I know, is quite complicated. There's a slide for that one. I'm not showing you that one. Professor Basavai has helped me in uh, uh, showing that one. But then that's too complicated, so I'm not going to the details of that one. But then the interesting point here is that the, uh, uh, when, a, the, when a change is substrate, I could isolate this compound also in one of these pieces. Okay? This is a compound in which this carbon dioxide is ready, uh, ready to get eliminated. Okay? And then when he did the, the when he passed through silica gel, carbon dioxide got eliminated, and then we could get that compound. That we could uh, uh, prove that one. But then, in addition to that one, another interesting thing that uh, uh, people have to know is this one. This is for the master students or PhD students or something like that. You many of you, while characterizing, you take the melting point. When you take the melting point, sometimes, okay, the compound may decompose. Sometimes there may be bubbling, okay. And in this particular case, there was bubbling which the student noticed. And therefore, I asked him to prove the uh, elimination of carbon dioxide by some other means, and that is what is shown here. You see that if you take TGA, elimination of carbon dioxide can be readily uh, noticed there. The weight loss corresponds exactly to the elimination of carbon dioxide. So that is something which uh, can be done when you want to explore things and then you want to find out what is happening in the reaction mixture. If you are carefully, uh, observing the reaction or the component. Okay, that's one type of system. And then when we change the type of propargyl alcohol that was used, what happened was this one. We have got uh, the same, uh, the uh, yeah, phosphor of this substrate. Okay, this is the propargyl alcohol. In this case, we got this particular component. We got this structure of that one, okay, which is shown over here. Okay, you see that one, two, three, four, five. Five fused rings are 
uh, there in this particular type of compound. Lot of people got interested in this one, but then we got about 70% yield of this particular compound, two compounds we were able to isolate. But then how this compound is being formed, that's also a mystery still, okay? But then one of the possible things is that it, uh, the one of the intermediates possibly is this one. The reason why I'm telling you this one is because if you use another ring system wherein some ferric bulk is there, we were able to isolate that type of compound. We got the extra type of a compound in which this type of mitre, this type of system is there with this particular ring. Okay, so we think that 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 is the kind of reaction that is taking place. You may say that uh, again chemists may again say that okay, this is not feasible, that is not feasible or not, but whatever it is, we have been able to get the compound, that is uh, the compounds have been uh, structurally characterized. That is an interesting reaction start. And then we used our, uh, the inorganic heterocyclic, a cyclodiphosphine, okay, with a similar type of, uh, uh, this one, propagula alcohol, but containing nitro group. This one, we think that the intermediate is this one, but what we obtained was compounds of this type, wherein this, uh, uh, when you indole knowns and all that are being formed. Even when you don't use the cyclophosphate type of substrate, normally, normal phosphate substrates also can lead to this one. We have isolated that one, but this I showed you just to show that uh, uh, cyclophosphates and other substrates also can utilize. You see the type of product that you get, okay, and the excess structure also is uh, shown over here. We got the two, the couple of keynote addresses and then that one, have, uh, what can I say, shown the reference over here. So that is the other type of reactions that can take place if you have functionalized propagyl alcohols and then uh, phosphorus free substrates. Then we moved on to other types of reactions using the alanine phosphonates and alanine phosphine oxide. These are general organic uh, type of reactions wherein palladium catalysis is being used and all that. Now the point there is that in a large number of reactions, uh, arg organic alines have been, traditional organic alines, the ones which do not contain phosphorus. I am talking about that one. There people have proposed a large number of intermediates wherein palladium is bonded uh, in an alline fashion and all that. So we are curious about uh, finding out whether such intermediates can be isolated, find out, uh, can be found or not. So in that context, we, we had done this reaction before and afterwards we wanted to continue that one. When we wanted to continue that one, what happened was this one. This alene is what we use and then palladium nanoparticles is what we use and then what, have, what has happened was a 4 plus 2 cycle addition. 4 plus 2 cycle addition is very common in organic chemistry, no doubt about it. But then the, one of the double bonds of the 6 member ring also is being involved in that one. But when you use palladium nanoparticles, the reaction, uh, the, the yield was not that high. But then if you use palladium acetate, the yield was really high. We could get uh, good yields of that particular product. But then, I just now I mentioned to you about the palladium intermediates and all that. People have proposed a lot and all that. But then you see that another compound that we isolated was this one. This particular compound has one palladium and two of those alene mites over there. Normally when you use uh, catalyst and all that, we use uh, 3 to 5 percent, maximum 5 percent also, 2 to 3 percent of uh, palladium acetate or whatever compound, whatever palladium catalyst that we use. But then here, one palladium is to two of those alleles. That means that in the reactions using palladium as a catalyst, okay, with alleles and all that, it is not just the ones which people propose this allyl type of into allyl, uh, uh, bonded to palladium and all that is not that that type. There are other types of things which can happen over there. If you have a carbonyl group there, then also it may be possible. We are not able to isolate them though, but in the phosphorus chemistry it is easier because we have the phosphorus NMR to handle over there. So this is the thing that I wanted to mention about that one. In addition to whatever you got there, you also can get compounds of this type. Now, whether that is the only type of compound or not, that is another thing that we are curious about. Then what we found was that when you <coughs> Dated this alene with palladium acetate in the presence of silver carbonate and all that. You see that there are three peaks over there. That means that all of them should contain palladium in some manner because the chemical shift is so downfield. Phosphorus chemical shift is so downfield. Only one of them you are able to isolate over there. That we could characterize by x So that is something which had not been there as far as the alene chemistry is concerned that we are able to isolate a palladium complex also over there. Now, there is also, uh, there are also many other reactions that we encountered when you use this alene chemistry, alines and all that. If you straight away add iodine, the iodine goes like this. No problem with that one. But then, if you treat that with tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, initial purpose, the student didn't know that that can act as a base or something like that. He used that one. But then when you do that one, you get back the alien. 
That is something which is uh, quite unique as far as the reaction chemistry is concerned. We have proof of those that kind of reaction by means of phosphorus and MRO over there. Now, another reaction that we encountered was that same kind of diode compound. When we treated that with cesium fluoride, we didn't know what compound was that one, what compound was this one in the beginning. We proposed the five number ring and all that, but finally we found that this is the type of compound. The excess structure we got very recently over there. Okay? I don't know how this can form from that one. That one iodine has gone to the other terminal carbon, and we also got back the starting material. So we got the HRMS and then for uh, this particular, this type of compound, we got an extra structure now. Okay, earlier we didn't have the extra structure, but now we have the extra structure. Now you notice that iodine is there on the same carbon here, but iodine is there on uh, two different carbons over there. All right, in, the, the, in continuation of that kind of work, what we wanted to do was to do the phosphorylation reactions and all that. In this context, we use the alleles, we also use the famous uh, Bailey Selman adduction, I should say, Basoya Bailey Selman adduction, things like that. Okay, that also we try to use. We got many compounds there. Here we wanted to see what kind of intermediate is there. One of the possibilities is that the chloride, you know, can attack the phosphorus center to form the pentaconate phosphorus. Okay, we tried a lot. We know that that compound is being, that type of compound is being formed, but we are not able to get an extra structure of that one. But then by phosphorus enema, we were able to prove that one. This, uh, which one is there, we do not know. But then you can see that the chlorine enema is there, so phosphorus enema is there, one H enema is there. This kind of a, uh, an isolation or the finding out of the intermediate in phosphorus chemistry, okay, phosphoryl uh, chemistry is not uh, there in the literature. Okay, this was published some time back. And then I told you about uh, this phosphorylation reaction. We were doing that one. In that process, what happened was that in one case, we obtained this palladium complex over there. It was serendipitous, but we obtained that one. But then we thought that why not use this compound as uh, a catalyst in many reactions and all that. Phosphorylation, we were successful. But then in addition to that one, we were also able to uh, use this uh, that, that particular compound for double arylation of alkynes. Double arylation means you have the heptide of this one and then you have another arylation also. Okay, two phenyl groups that could be introduced simultaneously. But in addition to that one, the important thing there is that you can use water, the yields are quantitative, and then the yields are quite good. That can be shown, that is shown in the, by means of the phosphorus NMR over here. Okay, using palladium one complex, that is this complex, and PD2 DBA price is what people had this done before. And you see that component after half an hour, after two hours and all that, this takes much longer time. The only unfortunate thing is that once the students found this one, the PhD was over and the next student didn't want to do that one so that uh, we couldn't develop this uh, catalyst much further. But then the point is that one, point is that uh, the uh, intermediate that we get, they can also be utilized as catalysts. One of them is this one. And then I'll go to the next topic. Uh, when uh, within five minutes, hello? Five minutes when it is there, it is in pump. Okay, then I'll go to ruthenium catalyst uh, reactions. Now, these are all reactions of the alkynes. Okay, I mentioned this one sometime before. These are normal CH activation reactions and all that. This is the reaction that we, uh, uh, we uh, that we had before using quinolines as the direct groups and all that. The only problem in this type of reactions is that uh, uh, the elimination of the uh, this one uh, direct groups is not that straight for us. That's not that easy. But then they are interesting reactions. But then the point that I want to make here is that people have proposed quite a few uh, different uh, intermediates and all that. But then one thing that they didn't propose is this type of an intermediate. Okay? They said all those things, this type of this OAC and acetate and all that they proposed. But then they didn't say that uh, under this condition this also can exist. But then we were able to isolate this kind of a complex in this particular reaction. We showed that one that can be isolated. In the next slide, I have shown you the X-ray structure also of that particular type of work, compound. So we showed that one. We showed that the mechanistic pathway they propose is not the entire, uh, what can I say, scenario. There is something else also which could happen. That's what we... Uh, that's what we saw. And a similar thing we could also accomplish by using the purine bases. Okay? 
this uh, this is the here the alkane addition takes place and then here there is an another, another interesting uh, reaction that has taken place the only problem with this one is that this is not uh, a general one we could isolate only some three or four compounds we were able to isolate but here you could isolate the, uh, uh, quite, quite a large number of uh, compounds this particular group could also be used for the this one uh, pure nucleosides and all that and then the, the other type of reaction we use this uh, the, is the same thing uh, here also, it is the, essentially the intermediate. Okay, intermediate we are able to isolate again the ruthenium intermediate. Okay, this also can be utilized as a catalyst. Okay, that is the possible pathway and all that. This is the general pathway which uh, most of the organometallist uh, metallist people know about it. Therefore, I will not elaborate on that one. Then. <coughs> Uh, we also were able to extend this one for this particular type of system using an amine and then CH activation and all that. You got this type of uh, this type of system wherein you have got the, uh, the alkane attack and there are uh, in addition to that one we also have got the uh, this one one part annihilation as well as uh, this stereo stereo selective hydro relation also put there. And then the normal alkanes and all that. Phosphines and alkynes, okay, a combination of that one is very widely used in organic synthesis and all that. And there again we were interested in finding out that the type of intermediates and all that. That's one reason why we also wrote the review on the Mitsunobu reaction and all that, wherein a tricoordinate phosphorus and dialkyl azodicarboxylate is involved. Now here in one of those cases we were able to isolate uh, this, type, uh, this type of compound over there, okay, wherein the phosphorus 3 compound attacks the, uh, this one. Uh, central carbon center. Okay, but then such a thing whether we can use it for other reactions and all that was our intent was there. Here you notice that if you use titanium phosphine, you get one type of product. You use if you use DAPCO, you get another type of uh, product. These things are not. I don't say that they are not known or something like that. But then in the case of uh, alines and enones, uh, this is the first report of that kind of thing. Okay, we showed that uh, there is a difference. This difference occurs mainly because in the case of phosphorus, the elytic formation is uh, that can be stabilized a little bit better when compared to a, uh, a base like uh, DAPCO or something like that, nitrogenous base. And then continuing with that one, we also did some bold catalyzed reactions on enones, enones and all that. One of the reactions that I wanted to highlight was this one. The normal reaction when you have an alkyne and all that is the well-known click reaction. But in this particular case, what we have is this uh, formation of the furan by means of the gold catalysis. Okay, the only interesting, the main interesting thing is uh, uh, that we got a six-member ring, not a five-member ring in this particular reaction. Okay, possible pathway is shown over there. Uh, then you see that in other cases, you can get the five-member ring, but that five-member ring does not involve any of the alkanes, but it involves the alkene might be okay. Okay, moving further, we then went on to check the vinamide reactivity. Vinamides are special types of alkynes wherein the reactivity of the uh, one carbon, the first carbon can be different from the other carbon and all that. Okay, one of the things that we could use, uh, use it for uh, is the sulfonamide chemistry wherein we use the elemental sulfur as a reactant. We could insert the elemental sulfur by means of this route. You have got an iodine there. You can introduce the sulfur or even selenium also over there. So many different types of compounds we were able to synthesize this. So many sulfur and all that. And then we also were able to use many nucleophiles. So similar, the substrate is similar over here, but then we were able to use sulfonamides, amines, phenols, and then actimethylene compounds also were able to uh, utilize. The type of reaction is slightly different from whatever I have shown you in the previous slide though. Okay? We, we don't know yeah. how much time I have. I'm, I'm happy to say we are half an hour behind schedule. Okay. Is it possible to make a, an no. end to your lecture in some slides? I see. Okay. Fine. No problem. <coughs> All right. Ah, this is the reaction and then in addition to that one, we also have another reaction wherein you have got 1,4 uh, oxygens or there is also 1,3 oxygen. That also can happen if you use different conditions over there. And then the other thing is the hydrogenation reactions and all that. One of the things that we could uh, accomplish was 
by using just normal ethanol in the case, uh, using any palladium catalyst, we are able to get the E isomer preferential in this one. Okay, that is something which is uh, quite interesting, I thought. Okay, that is the possible pathway. Okay, continuation of that one, this one is, we are not published that one, but then you see that. Uh, Vinamide and alkane and all sorts of things can happen if you use them and if you want to use them for catalysis and all that. Okay. Continuing with the alkane system, just one or two minutes. Okay. You have got this uh, proposition indoor system, proposal of course, you got uh, many interesting things for you. One of the things that I want to highlight is the tassel migration over there. Okay. That was uh, published very recently. This one I will not go into the details of that one, except to mention that uh, people use this kind of system for a lot of catalysts and all that, but they never mention that the time those are can be formed in those reactions and all that. That should act as a caveat for people. So to highlight whatever I have told you so far, phosphorylated alin, some chemistry I have told you about, a new type of dimerization, new palladium one free catalyst or catalyst whatever you want to call that, very effective for double aerylation. And then some intermediates in ruthenium catalyzed alkane insertion. And then gold catalysis, inanol, inanol, and all that. Azide, uh, azide and alkane, 3 plus plus cycle addition. Okay? And then vinamide reactivity. Then semi hydrogenation, semi hydrogenation using ethanol. And then the tri indole formation, uh, formation I didn't tell you, but that should act as a caveat for people who use indoles as well as palladium catalysis in this case. Okay? Now, I have combined so many things, this is what I just wanted to show you, okay, three or four or five different topics, okay, one, two, three, four, five and all that, so that's how I normally talk, okay, too many themes in one talk, and then I think that I am this one, but in front of many stalwarts, particularly organic chemistry stalwarts, I am just this one, okay, thank you. Professor Swami, thanks for your interesting talk, it's unfortunate you haven't got the